collect uh, these books, um, a legacy from uh, uh, Mr. Rafa Ortigas, whose belief was that he was very unhappy with uh, uh, history being written either by the victors or usually by the oppressed, and and and, and usually they were they were sort of reflexive or or uh, very uh, nationalist. And so he felt that he should collect everything possible on the Philippines so that people start to write, read, research, and write on, on, on matters with a, much more, with a much more Catholic point of view, with a, with a, with a not capital C. And so <laughs> we, appreciate, we appreciate Glenn's presence here because uh, to me, I remember in some of the Philippine Studies conferences that I would attend, whenever somebody mentioned Glenn May, all the Filipinos would go, oh my God, that Americano is telling us what our history is about, you know? And so, and imagine, you know, this heretic talking about how maybe uh, Bonifacio was a, not, maybe not a very uh, real, re real hero. All these kinds of things, but I think I really, what I like about Glenn is that um, as we, as I was part of the Agoncillo, you know, all the, the yeah. Renato Constantino stuff, right, of the 70s, they, I'm glad that I'm still alive. What you do is you start saying, was that the way history was really about? Is there a little bit more nuance to this thing? Is there a little bit more subtlety? Is there some more like grace in between rather than uh, what, is, what is correct? or what is, who are the bad guys and who are the good guys. And I, I, I'm glad that people like Glenn uh, push this thing and say to us, you know, we should do a lot more research. We should really uh, take advantage of materials like in our library so that you really get an open sense. And, and people should have a point of view that says, this is my point of view. Uh, it's not a Constantino turnaround, you know, but it's rather my point of view. And I think that really makes uh, for a lot more healthier understanding of our history. So I decided to pick the three that I personally like the most. Um, they are the first essay in the book, um, which is entitled The Making of a Myth, John Letty Phelan and the Hispanization of Land Tenure in the Philippines, which is better than it sounds, actually. Um, the third essay uh, in, in the book is my, my second choice. Uh, that's Warfare by Pulong, Bonifacio Aguinaldo, and the Philippine Revolution against Spain. And then the, the seventh essay, uh, Father Frank Lynch on the Shaping of Philippine Social Science. So it's a mixed bag. Of course, essay collections often are a mix, mixed bag. Um, why do I like these three more than the others? Um, well, I'm being a little playful here, but I, the simple, honest answer is um, that all three of them are examples of a type of essay I'm very fond of. Here I'm talking about discursive strategy and how one puts these things to, uh, together. It's a type of essay. Um, um, and this type uh, has what I like to call aha moments. Aha, aha moments. Essays that have a climax of a sort to the extent that they can have have a climax. Um, essays that wait to tell you at the end what they're really about. Um, essays that may even cause you to pause for a moment and say, aha. Uh, so, and that's what this essay is really about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Well, let me begin by telling you about the first essay. The Making of a Myth, John Letty Phelan and the Hispanization of Land Tenure in the Philippines. Appeared in the, the Journal of Philippine Studies in 2004. What's the essay about? On one level, it's an extended critique of the res research of a number of highly regarded Philippine historians. The principal, being, uh, principal one being an American scholar, a professor at the University of Wisconsin named John Lady Phelan. Phelan was best known, frankly, for his work on Latin America. But he decided in uh, his own personal aha moments that he would try to do work on the Philippines. And so he produced this. This, this one book. He, he did his research, he wrote, the, wrote it up, and he moved on to, to other things. But the book had a pretty substantial impact. Um, now, the thesis of my essay is pretty straightforward. Um, I argue that virtually everything we know about the nature of land tenure in the Philippines from roughly uh, the, the 1560s 
that is the end of the Hispanic period, pre, or end of the pre-Hispanic period, um, to uh, about 1700, that is after approximately a century and a half of Spanish colonial rule, that almost all of that is almost certainly wrong. Um, the common wisdom is that private land holding, as we understand it, was essentially non-existent uh, in most of the Philippines before the Spanish conquest. Uh, that communal holdings were the norm, and private holdings were largely a product of Spain introducing into the Philippines what might be called, and Phelan himself called, the European, European concept of private land holding, um, and in the process then converting large sections of commun communal lands into private holdings. Okay. Now, let me underline the point that in the late 1990s, when I started doing research on the subject of land tenure in the Philippines, the common wisdom amounted to an article of faith. Um, and let me add that at the time, I myself accepted this article of faith, that Phelan was right. And, yeah, that is, I fully believed the conventional wisdom was correct. Then I started looking seriously at the scholarly literature on land tenure in the Philippines. I was in the Netherlands at the time, um, based at the University of Amsterdam, a uh, recipient of a, a fellowship from the Netherlands-based International Association for Asian Studies, or IIAS. So I was there to work on a project, including this project. Um, so I was, I was doing research on Philippine land, land tenure um, in the 1990s because I was then considering the possibility of writing a one-volume general history of the Philippines and figured that some discussion of Philippine land tenure practices would be needed in an early chapter. You know, just you know, something you have to write about. For that reason, I turned to the major scholarly treatments of Philippine land tenure. And one of the first books I consulted was John Letty Phelan's The Hispanization of the Philippines. Now, I, I gotta confess, I, I'm, I had first read Phelan's book in the early 1970s, two decades before, during my years as a graduate student. And truth be told, I liked it a lot. Um, but when I looked at it again in the 1990s, I didn't. I didn't like it at all. One thing that struck me was the documentary evidence <coughs> cited by him uh, to support his thesis that communal land holdings predominated in the, Span in, in the uh, pre-Spanish period, that <coughs> that thesis um, was based on a tiny number of primary sources. And when I actually looked at these sources, I found that the evidence in the documents did not support Phelan's assertions. Well, th this is how I, I put it in the, the essay I'm talking about. In summary, <coughs> Phelan's analysis of land tenure in the early Spanish period is deficient on several counts. Uh, some statements are <coughs> unsupported by documents. Others are contradicted by the cited sources. Given all that, we would be unwise indeed to credit automatically Phelan's claims that the coming of the Spaniards brought major changes to land holding in the Philippines. Well, okay. That's one thing I discovered. Second thing I discovered was that in the decades following the publication of Phelan's book, uh, other scholars um, writing about land tenure in the Philippines essentially repeated Phelan's claims. It was becoming orthodoxy. That is, Phelan's account came to be accepted. Uh, and what's more, it became orthodoxy despite the fact that several of those later land tenure specialists who had written them up uncovered very unsettling evidence that seemed to call Phelan's claims into question. But for some reason, although the specialists noted in that their data contradicted Phelan's account here and there, they always stopped short of suggesting that Phelan was basically wrong. I found that puzzling. What the heck was going on there? Why didn't they come to the obvious conclusion that Phelan's account was deficient. I mean, the footnotes bore no relation at all to reality. Um, that he, had, he hadn't done much research. That the research he had done was shoddily done and shouldn't be taken seriously. I get excited about these things. Um, a third thing I discovered was that Phelan was mistaken about something else. A, a key assumption, assertion in Phelan's account is that landholding practices 
in Spain privileged private landholders. Um, his point being that during its time as a colonial power, Spain was changing landholding practices in the Philippines to make them conform to Spanish practices. Huh? Okay. But in fact, as I discovered from reading recent scholarly accounts of Castilian land tenure in the 16th century, um, I discovered that historians of Spain today don't believe that Spain had any such predisposition to communal landholding in that period. They don't. Um, rather, they tell us that in the, in the 16th century, Spain itself had, be, had perhaps the most highly developed system of communal holdings of anywhere in Europe, and probably in the world. Rather than being wedded to private land ownership, Spain featured a vast variety of communal practices. So, in light of all of the above, and frankly much more, I, I came to the, the, the conclusion that the existing literature on landholding in the Philippines was not to be trusted. Um, it, it got just about everything wrong, hopelessly wrong. And above all, it was flawed because for half a century after Phelan's book was published, scholars continued to give credence uh, to this hopeless, poorly documented, demonstra uh, demonstrably wrong-headed analysis of, of, of Phelan. I, I get into this. And, and, and that gave me pause. How had historians of the Philippines gotten something so important as landholding practices so completely wrong? I found that unsettling. How was that possible? Well, okay. So, for a while I, I couldn't answer the question. Why did Phelan come up with the particular formula formulation he came up with? That communal land predominated in the Philippines before the Spanish arrived. And after the, their arrival, the Spanish emphasized private landholding. And why did scholars who followed Phelan accept that formulation, even though their own findings told them otherwise? All that made no sense to me. And then, aha. You were waiting for this, I know. Uh, suddenly it did make sense. Aha, my personal aha moment. The answer to my question was the linear model. Well, that's something of a put down, a letdown, I suppose. Um, well, here's how I can uh, convey the, it in my conclusion. Um, the time has come to discard the Phelan formulation, or at least to classify it as unproven while more research is done on the subject. In truth, that formulation never deserved to be taken as seriously as it has been taken. Helen looked at a few sources on land tenure, provided unreliable readings of virtually all of them. Uh, beyond that, there's good reason to believe that Felling was predisposed to reach the conclusions he did. And I'll get back to that. Phelan was, after all, a product of its time and its culture, and he reflected the operating assumptions of both. One of those assumptions, for centuries a widely prevalent assumption in the West, is that most of the time, communal land tenure arrangements have existed among groups categorized as tribal. A corollary of that assumption is a second, that over time, as these societies have moved upward on some culturally constructed developmental ladder, private landholding arrangements have taken over. One finds versions of the linear model of historical change in the publications of Marx and Engels. One finds it in the historical literature concerning much of the former colonial world, uh, most notably Latin America. One continues to find it today in discussions about the rights of indigenous people in the Philippines and elsewhere. But however appealing and how uh, and often in invoked this linear model may be, it doesn't help us understand the evolution of land tenure arrangements in the Philippines. Nor, for that matter, as various scholars have demonstrated, does it help us to do justice to Philippine indigenous peoples in the present, since it is variance with, at variance with on-the-ground tenure realities. It may be argued that Phelan was uniquely predisposed to adopt the linear model. First and foremost, a specialist of Latin America, he wrote at a time when the standard view in scholarly circles 
uh, was that in matters of land tenure, Spain had done great damage to Mexico. That's, he's a Latin American. Um, substituting a system based on private property for one that had been communal and paving the way for the emergence of haciendas. That was an article of faith in Latin American history. In effect, steeped in an historiographical tradition that privileged the linear model, Phelan simply assumed and claimed but never proved that it applied to the Philippines. And here's the kicker. Curiously, over the course of the past 40 years, students of Mexican history have exposed that standard that he was invoking um, as myth. Lockhart, Harvey, Horn, and others have shown us that a concept akin to private ownership of land prevailed among the Nahua of Mexico. Taylor has pointed out that large estates were slow to develop outside the Central Valley of Mexico, and Lockhart has shown that many aspects of the indigenous land system survived intact for at least a century. In other words, as I suggested about the Philippines, the changes introduced by Spain and land tenure were nearly as radical, neither as radical nor as complete as they once were claimed to be. So this was, in effect, part of a pattern. Um, let me turn to the, my, ne my next selection. Um, the third essay in the collection, the title of the piece is, um, I hope intriguing, Warfare by Pulong, Bonifacio, Aguinaldo, uh, and the Philippine Revolution uh, against Spain. So Pulong, medium. Um, it deals, this essay, with one of the most studied and written about events in the Philippine past, the F Philippine Revolution, 1896-97. It deals with arguably the single most puzzling and unsettling development in the revolution of 96-97. The conflict between the two principal leaders, Bonifacio and Aguinaldo, and one striking thing about the revolution of 1896, all Filipinos are aware of, is this conflict in the ranks. Remarkably, one of the revolutionary heroes, Aguinaldo, ordered the death of another hero, Bonifacio. Um, now, over the years, I devoted a great deal of time to doing research about and attempting to understand the Philippine Revolution. I dealt with it to some extent in Battle for Batangas. Um, I dealt with it in Inventing a Hero. Um, even so, I was never satisfied with my efforts to explain the Bonifacio Aguinaldo conflict. Um, one small thing in particular bothered me, another puzzle. The puzzle came to my attention while I was reading a published memoir uh, of a Filipino military leader uh, named Santiago Alvarez, um, prominent. Piwang figure, a major player in the events of the revolution. Alvarez had written his memoir in the 1920s. It had appeared uh, at that time in serial form in a Tagalog language publication. Then 1992, Ateneo de Manila University Press published a new edition of Alvarez's mem memoir in Tagalog, but also with an English translation. Um, and it's that Ateneo edition that I've used in my research. Well. One aspect of that memoir particularly caught my eye. Albert's recounting of the frequent meetings, Manga Pulong, um, held by the Filipino revolutionaries in 1896. He described two different types of gatherings. One's attended by members of the Katipunan, um, the secret society that had launched the upris uprising. And there also were Pulong held by Filipino military units after the hostilities had begun. Now, the sheer number of meetings of soldiers um, was striking. They, they, they met all the time. They met more than they fought. Uh, according to Alvarez, the Filipino leaders even held meetings in the middle of battles. It's like they, they, they took timeouts. OK, meeting time, and right. What was going on there? Um, well, they were losing the battles. That, that's one thing that was going on. According to, yeah, so. 
in the middle of battles. Oh, I was baffled. I publicly acknowledged my bafflement uh, in a footnote in Inventing a Hero. I said, I do not understand what's going on here. Uh, if anybody can help me, please do. Um, that was published, uh, Inventing a Hero, in, in 1996. But I wasn't able to offer any explanation. I just didn't ha even have a wild guess. Why did the revolutionaries hold so many meetings? OK, seven years later, fast forward, 2003, new millennium. Um, I returned to what I now called, at least in my house household, the Poulong puzzle. Every once in a while, they, they'd see me around the house. I'd be glum. And they'd say, Poulong puzzle. I just, you know, it was, it was, it was the, the great defeat of, of my life. Um, and I've had many to choose from. Um, I, I, was just, I was determined to solve the Poulong puzzle. So I retrieved many boxes of Xerox documents from a storage closet in home. I began to reread all the texts, done what I'd done before. Um, and this time, with fresher eyes, I hope, I saw clues and connections that had eluded me. So I had another aha moment. War Warfare by Poulenc, published in 2007, not only provides an answer to the Poulenc puzzle, but it offers a new and, I, I, I believe, important explanation of the conflict in the revolutionary ranks in 96-97. Um, that, that's that conflict which, that led to the displacement of Bonifacio as the leader of the revolution, to his trial and conviction, ultimately to his death. 